session three of our uh, notebooks training. Um, I won't do much of the introduction since um, I'm assuming that you've maybe seen that before. We'll concentrate mostly on um, the use of Mystic Pi with um, um, with Sentinel notebooks, since that's the kind of uh, the core library and the thing that we get most kind of questions about. So quick. Oh, did I, I didn't share my screen. I should probably do that. <laughs> OK, can people see what looks like a blue and white notebook? Yes. Good, good. OK, let's try again with the contents. So a uh, quick introduction, some what's new stuff. Um, we did cover data queries last time, but we're going to do a quick recap of that and add some other detail. Um, then a sort of like a preview of incident triage notebook that Pete Bryan, the presenter of the last session, is working on. Um, this is really just as a, a sort of an example of um, a kind of an incident you might use to use the rest of the content of the notebook, the rest of this presentation's notebook um, in kind of drilling down on more details, getting more context. So it's really just a, a sort of scene setting element, uh, then looking at kind of other other parts of getter enrichment like threat intelligence, some further details on visualization, and then we have time with a, an extra on um, open threat research uh, data sets, security data sets that have like sample attacks that are very useful to use when testing and just kind of messing around. OK, so. Um, so if you haven't already, uh, I'm not saying do do that right now, but to certainly go back and watch the first two in the series if you haven't seen them, the sort of basic introduction, getting configured and all that kind of stuff. And the second one, like start to use Mystic Pi uh, to create your own notebooks, dealing with exceptions, basic kind of data queries, uh, visualizations and all that kind of stuff. So uh, a couple of bits of news. Um, We've been working with uh, both Azure Machine Learning and Log Analytics to get a more integrated authentication feel. Um, so uh, that means that you sh you should be able to use the authenticate when you authenticate to Azure Machine Learning, then that will also provide your authentication credentials for uh, connecting to. Microsoft Sentinel, you shouldn't um, need to kind of log on again every time you connect to a data connector. So you get kind of an integrated auth feeling. Um, there's a, a, a bit of a caveat with that, that um, although Log Analytics allows credentials from AML to Azure Machine Learning, that is, to um, act as its credentials some azure services don't do that so key vault azure key vault is one of those so so you may still need and i still kind of use this um azure cli logon and you can either do this or from a um a terminal accessed via uh accessed via this little icon up here OK, so we always start with this kind of import Mystic Pi and <clears throat> it's had a few different incarnations, but this init notebook, this does some initialization, checks versions. I think you may well have seen this before. Um, the second bit of news is that, although it's still not great, our uh, configuration editor um, at least loads. You don't have to kind of like book a lunch slot. There's some issue with the way that the notebook rendering works in um, um, in the AML notebooks interface. That means that all of the widgets that are used to build this execute really, really slowly. Uh, it's a lot better than it was. So uh, it's still, t you know, some individual screens take a while to load. Um, 
but it's more usable, but still give it patience. And if you if you can't give it patience, then um, you can always opt to. Uh, and, and you could do this anyway, if you're more familiar with the Jupyter Classic or the Jupyter Lab or even the, the VS Code, which is what I use actually now as my main notebook editor. Um, and you know, if you're going to do a bit of configuration, maybe just run it in, in one of those areas. OK. Um, something we didn't cover last time was extras. Now, what, what extras are a way of installing a package and specifying kind of optional dependencies. It doesn't it doesn't um, affect the. The like Mystic Pi itself, when you're installing Mystic Pi, uh, you still get all of the code, but there are some dependencies <coughs> that we don't install by default when you just do pip install Mystic Pi. Uh, so an example is maybe the Splunk libraries, virus total, risk IQ. <clears throat> Excuse me, I have a bit gravelly voice. Um, and you can specify these, but these are the names of all of the extras. So we're going to be using, uh, we're not going to be using virus total, but we are going to be using risk IQ. So uh, even if you already installed Mystic Pi, you can kind of rerun this and uh, just to get the extra dependencies. Um, it should say that we've already got all that stuff. Well, that's the kind of experience. And if you're doing any kind of pip install from within a notebook in, in AML, um, and you should do, probably do it within notebooks anyway, use percent pip rather than you can execute execute it using a uh, exclamation mark, but the um, percent means that it will install in the, will be sure to install the thing you're installing in the kernel you're currently using rather than some system Python. Um, if you try and use something in Mystic Pi that doesn't have the right dependency, you'll get this kind of exception happening, an Im extra import error, and it will tell you which uh, this isn't actually a real thing, but it will say, you know, do run the command pip install Mystic Pi risk IQ or something if you try to access uh, libraries that haven't been installed. <clears throat> okay. So a bit quick recap on um, data queries. This is the kind of uh, normal way you load a, a query provider and you can load multiple of these simultaneously. Um, so here we're loading the one for still call. We, I think we start, I think you're now able to do, oh, maybe not yet. The next version you'll be able to do Azure Sentinel, um, but for the moment, you'll have to still call it Azure Sentinel, as I still do every day. Um, and then connecting, this was previously, this would be, you know, pop up a code, go to go to logon dot, uh, whatever it is, um, depending on what your cloud was, go to a logon page, paste in the code, a kind of painful experience, but now it should use, um, um, managed um, service, I'm not even sure it's called managed service and the MSI is just called, uh, uses that to kind of do a um, pass through authentication to um, to Microsoft Sentinel. Uh, I think we probably saw the, the query browser last week, like not last week, last, last session, um, where you can see the help for each of the queries. Um, you can also do this from a quickly from a, a command line just by typing a question mark in in quotes. It will show you all the parameters that are needed for that particular query. And you can see here some are marked optional, uh, some are not. And this is an example of using the query where we're specifying a our parameter host name. And this will show you, <coughs> shows you the number of records and the time range. We're just printing that out in this section. Uh, some of the more observant of you might have noticed there were other things here that were not marked optional, such as start and end. Where did they come from? Because we didn't supply them in it when we when we called the query. 
So each query provider has its own little um, time time range widget and a time range. So it, it by default for the built-in queries, at least it will supply this time range, which is set by default to be now minus a day. Um, <clears throat> so you can change that. Uh, let's and grab a bit more. And if we, and by default, that will be the time range that the queries are executed in a little bit like the, the log analytics, the Sentinel log. So now you can see we've got more records and these roughly kind of correspond with the time that we set there. You can override this when you run the query. So here we're manually specifying start and end. And these are date time, need to be date time fields, but you can specify them as a date time, a Python date time, pandas date time, pandas timestamp, a string like this, a query that looks like a date time, or a number. And then when you supply them as numbers, then they are, um, this is interpreted as zero is right now, and these are offsets from right now. So they could be like 0.5 of a day, that kind of thing, minus 0.5. Obviously, if 0.5 in the future it doesn't probably doesn't make any sense, but uh, negative numbers for uh, uh, for your start and end. So we had some requests about other data sources, particularly Microsoft Defender 365. Um, the thing I'm connecting to doesn't support M365D. Let me zoom in a little bit for that. Uh, so for the moment, all, and all of our queries, built-in queries are are also MDE. Um, you can use either of these typically. Uh, this uses, one of them will use the Microsoft Defender for Endpoint um, API URL. The other one will use Microsoft 365, which is a superset of the, of the Defender. Um, the, a particular thing that I'm connecting to here um, doesn't yet doesn't yet have Microsoft full Microsoft Defender switched on, so that's why I'm using MDE. Uh, we still have to do need to do a little bit of renaming. So these are this is just a list. I'm using list queries as I I did I show you before? I don't think so. List queries uh, by default returns everything but you can specify a parameter like I only want to look at host things or uh, I only want to look at. So these are examples of some of the built-in queries we have for, um, for Microsoft Defender for endpoint. Um, obviously you can get the help in the same, the same way. We can try running one of those que queries or we can, you can, we can, we'll do that in the next cell. This one, you can also, it supports obviously the same um, syntax as Microsoft Sentinel. So you can just send it, send it any query you like by using exec query. We're just trying to find which, which hosts are active in this, in this environment. Um, and then we can use one of the built-in queries that we saw a moment ago, list host processes. Just anything in the last tenth of a day to get the events for that host. So that's it's very like the querying Microsoft Sentinel experience. Um, so why am I showing you list queries again? Well, <clears throat> so you might be thinking, well, you know, there's all these queries that are built in, but where do they come from? Um, can I create my own? Um, and you can. So let's zoom in on this. So all of the queries we have built in are defined in YAML files. I'd suggest you don't edit those, but you can certainly create new versions of them and use them as inspiration. Um, and each query looks like this. So there's a, whoa, I didn't mean to do that. Um, so it has a name. They all, they all occur in this sources um, key, and we'll look at a, a bigger file to see the context in a moment. 
So each one has a name, a description. The query is defined as a simple text string in these YAML files. And you'll notice in here we've got these curly braces that define the replaceable parameters. Uh, underneath there's a parameters definition. So any of the parameters you specify in the query, in order for them to be parameters in the function, like we saw host name earlier on, they need to be defined somewhere in the query file. And it's kind of language agnostic. So if you're using Splunk, you can put Splunk queries or OData queries. Uh, it doesn't care about the language it uses as long as it's a string and it has can have like replaceable items in it it will it will work obviously it, only for the data providers we currently support but we're adding new ones all the time uh, let's look at the context a little bit more so this is a, a whole query um, i don't have time to actually create one and save it but we can see down at the bottom uh this was our this is an example of a, a query and it's located in the sources subkey but we also have a couple of other subkeys of metadata um and unless you kind of are kind of feeling very confident then I, i'd advise you get you dig into the mystic pi code get or get it from github and copy and paste one so you know this the uh, the data environments def define which drivers it works with. Um, is is um, that's what appears to, as the prefix of the query, <clears throat> and we're a bit out of date. All our defender queries currently start with MDATP, but we'll up kind of upgrade that soon. But we have some backward compatibility problems too. Um, like we don't want everybody's queries in existing notebooks to break, so. We're leaving that for the moment. Um, one important is the defaults. Here you can you can specify common parameters that are used in the in each of your queries, so you don't have to define them per query. These are by default inherited by everything in the sources section. So here, like every, pretty much everything has start and table name, um, and we only have to so in our even though we have multiple parameters in our list ip connections thing most of these are defined globally we only have to define the the ip address so once you've got your query in a yaml file um, or multiple queries you can have as many queries as you like in a single file and multiple files <clears throat> save them to a folder and you can either set up in config in your mystic pi config file you can add this section and this is a list each dash here is a, a list item you can have as many of those things obviously typically you wouldn't have a mixture of windows and linux paths but or mac paths but um uh you can have as many many of those and it will search uh, all of those folders for queries and load them uh, alternatively you can just specify query paths to be searched as runtime when you create the query provider. Um, we're specifying a path there to, for it to load queries from. So um, if you have any interesting queries, please um, get in touch with us or like submit them to as as pull requests to the Mystic Pi GitHub. We'd be very grateful for new and interesting queries from it for any of our um, any of our providers. <clears throat> so this this is the largest block of code that we'll see and because i'm a little bit pressed for time i'm not going to um go into this in, in a, a lot of detail i'm really going to skip um but it, you you can download the notebook at the end of this and look at it um i'd suggest waiting for pete's um pete's notebook to really understand it but <clears throat> this is just the uh, the kind of internals of an incident um and here we see the incident we see as this is just one alert but it has a couple of um entities attached to it an ip address a host an account another account and this is kind of typical of uh, alerts you'd see in microsoft sentinel uh, they're going to have like multiple alerts and multiple entities 
um, Pete's notebook will allow you to kind of like get that uh, that and browse it. So when you see that, what do you do with them? Obviously, you, you did, as an investigator, you want more context on on these things. Like for IP address, you might want to look up threat intelligence. For a host, you might want to find a if it's Azure VM. You might want to find out the, the VM details, the owner, what operating system it has. So let's look at enriching data. And last time we did cover uh, enriching with threat intelligence. And we had this kind of pattern. I won't spend a lot, a lot of time on this because um, uh, it was covered last time and uh, we have a, a nicer way of doing it uh, in, a, in a couple of moments. So we create um, our threat into lookup provider um, and then call this function to um, look up a IP address. And I think we also sort of take a little bit of time because it's consulting a lot of different uh, so relatively recent risk IQ provider. So we're getting results. That's not particularly nice way of looking at the results. So we also have a browser that we can. Uh, if you have multiple, you search for multiple things. Then they will be listed here and then for each provider. You get the details of the response. I think we covered um, the Microsoft Sentinel APIs that have just had a bit of a revamp um, to, uh, to add more of those in a, in a recent release, a 1.61 release. Um, this is another kind of like a non-threat intel um, example of enrichment using Azure data. So here we're connecting to the Azure data provider. Um, and we're using a Sentinel query to get the the full resource ID of the machine that we're interested in. And here it is just printing out that that ID. Uh, and then we can use that to query. Our Azure data provider. Um, to get more information about the. The host where. Uh, we're supplying our resource ID of the host here. And there is more stuff that you could get. With this, you can kind of carry on using the, the Azure resource graph, for example, to drill down into all sorts of details, but. Um, but some things you can see here like you. Can, we have the operating system type. Uh, and. Also about the network interfaces, all that kind of good stuff. So another useful kind of diagnostic thing that you might want to use when you're investigating an incident. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't have who it's managed by. Uh, but often you'll see that and you'll be able to go and. Ask the person who manages the machine, like what's going on with this machine? Why is it in an alert? So that's our more classic interface to to getting context and enrichment. Um, but I wanted to introduce you to something that we have probably touched on a little bit before, but um, so we wrote a lot of functions and a lot of capabilities to do different kinds of context lookup enrichment. Um, but these were a little bit all over the place and they often had a different pattern of loading them. Um, and just through human uh, fallibility, you know, where the parameters were different because they were written at different times. Um, so we had this problem of both discoverability and consistency and usability across all of these different functions. So we decided, um, and also just to, like to remember, yeah, remembering what do I need to import at this point if I want to do a threat intel lookup. Um, so we decided to use entities as the pivot points around which to hang this different kinds of functionality. Um, and it will become clearer as I, I think I show you an example. So uh, this is going to be, this is loading the pivot. Um, it's called a pivot provider. We call everything provider, I guess. Um, uh, saying it's not defined, but 
AML notebooks is wrong. It is defined. Um, so we've what we've done here is um, dynamically con gone around Mystic Pi and pulled different bits and pieces um, of the functionality, queries, enrichment, and attached them to a set of entities. Uh, and in a moment, I think this will pop up, pop up. So these are some of the entities. These are the entities we found functions for. So an account, DNS, which is another thing of domain name, IP address. So it's not every entity that could exist and does exist, but it's um, the ones that are kind of commonly used, um, commonly occur in alerts and investigations. And these things on the right are the functions available in the entity. So we can see a lot of queries here for, um, for a host. Um, IP address is a mix of queries. It has uh, specific providers for things like um, geolocation, IP type, who is a threat intel lookup. So how do these work? Well, you need to import entities. So there is something you need to remember. Um, import specific entities, and each one of them has this function, pivots, which, which is like list queries that will just list all of the pivots that are available. Uh, and you use them like this. So, um, IP address who is, IP address geolocation, And it goes and fetches that the details from that and reports them back as a, a data frame. So compare that to the code we saw earlier about doing all of this stuff to do a TI lookup with the code here, where we're uh, like it's like a single line of of text. I think it's much easier. And it's much easier to remember that these are attached to IP address rather than in somewhere weird that we have to import them from. Um, and we can still do the browsing on this thing in the same way. Obviously, you in this case, you have to remember to import TI lookup to browse this stuff. But um, but I think I hope you'll agree that it's kind of an improvement on where we were before. Um, so this is. Um, the host entity, as I said, queries are also available. So any time that you define a query and it has host name as a parameter, it will add that dynamically to the, to the pivots for host. So this is looking up. Um, so it's running a query uh, and we, we, it still supports all of the query parameters like add additional query items. Um, so as long as the host has so, sorry, as long as the query has the right kind of parameter like IP address, uh, account name, then it will get harvested up and added to, to these uh, to these pivots. And I think we may have seen so since we launched, we loaded two providers. Excuse me, scrolling back a bit. Um, we hold a whole, whole bunch of Azure Sentinel queries, but we also have the MDE queries because we've loaded both providers. OK. So pivots are the future. Um, and that's not all about pivots. So often you don't have a single IP address or a single host to look up. You might have a thing like this. This is just me pasting in chunks from a um, some threat intel report or some other report where I've got a mix of IP addresses and other kinds of junk. Um, I'm using our one of our magics to filter that out and to save it as a, an IP address list. So it, uh, it just goes through all the text and looks for things that looks like IPs. Um, and it will do that for hashes and domain names and URLs. In this case, we, there are only IPs defined here. Um, so we can, uh, this is just a way of getting a list of items. And to show you the, the who is function that we saw earlier on, we could also pass it a list. Um, 
and it will work in the same way as you know there's no difference in the, the parameters it, it will understand a list it will understand a single item and it un understands data frames as uh, input values and here it's just looked at a who is look up on all of the contents of that list uh, some of them are a bit strange they're all kind of like nans um, and that's um, yeah, that's because we lost the context on what the IP address we were looking up was. If we if we specify this additional parameter to join, then that will join the input, in this case, a list of IP addresses to the output. So this is our input column and we can see um, the reason for the NANDs is we were, we were doing a who is lookup on uh, 10 ad addresses like private address space, and obviously they don't have any ownership because they're by definition private address space. <clears throat> so one of the nice things about pivots is because they accept data frames as an input and produce data frames as an output, you can chain them together in a, in a, a pandas data frame pipeline. So we're going to get a, um, a sort of sample small example just get a little sample of the ip addresses from that previous list and then we can we're going to first look up uh who is on that sample then we're going to use this data frame accessor mp pivot run to run another pivot to get the geolocation uh each time we are joining the input with the output so we and then finally we're going to do a ti lookup on the result of that and each time notice when we're using a data frame as an input we also have to supply it this input column as another parameter because a data frame obviously has multiple multiple columns so the pivot function needs to know which column you're intending as the input um, so if we run that, we should get a, it's a car rather wide data frame, but useful in many cases. Um, you can see that we've got the, uh, oh, that's not what I meant to do. Um, we've got, first of all, the who is results. Let's scroll down a little. Uh, further along, we've got the GOIP results. And then finally, tacked onto the end, we've got the, yep, the, um, the TI results. So we've got an, an amalgamated data frame that does multiple things. And that's it's often like very helpful in um, when you're doing kind of like patterns that you always want to do in, in uh, in investigations to chain multiple of these things together and call them um, in a you know single single line of code rather than having to save the output from one and paste it into another that kind of thing so pivot pipelines you can do more complex um, much more complex examples than that you can see in the, uh, some of the documentation you can add visualizations in the middle of the pipeline and that kind of stuff right Risk IQ. So, um, Risk IQ contributed before they were bought by Microsoft, or before they merged. Yeah, bought by Microsoft. I guess that's right. Um, contributed this library, this provider for Mystic Pi, before they got bought, and they were kind of purchased in the process of. I don't think it had anything to do with them contributing code to Mystic Pi, but um, uh, when they started building it, then by the time it was kind of checked in and published they were a microsoft property so we were really thrilled to have this company well respected threat intel company and, and kind of very specialized interesting data um to have them contribute to some stuff but then by the time we actually got it published it was just a microsoft another microsoft thing anyway great stuff doesn't diminish the value of it um and these are available as pivots if you have a, a risk iq account we can see uh, this didn't work last night but it did work earlier this morning come on risk iq don't fail me 
Oh, I, I don't think it's risk IQ. I think I'm not sure what it is. That's that's a bad sign. Anyway, let's not wait too long for that. Uh, it's a pity because I wanted to show this. This is an example of um, uh, of using risk IQ functions in a pipeline. Here we're doing resolving this suspicious main record. Um, this is a mixture of like risk IQ core pandas things and uh, mystic pi pivots. Second thing is just filtering out. So we only have a type records. Then running pivots to get the geolocation details. Displaying an intermediate. Um, like this is displaying what the data frame looks like at this point in the pipeline, not necessarily the end result. And then finally running a, a, a re reverse resolution so that any IP addresses that uh, were resolved from teamworks555.com, I uh, would get all the IP addresses from that, and then it would do, it, so it would essentially find other domains that were also registered to that, those IP addresses. Uh, it doesn't look like it's gonna work. No, timeout, that's what I got last night, but it worked this morning, how really infuriating. <laughs> I don't know quite what that is. Um, okay. How am I doing? I'm a little bit, a little bit behind time. So let's try and do these quickly. So a visualization. Um, so some things are not entity related, not kind of entity based. Like some things are just masses, mass data. So we can't make them pivot functions. Um, instead, what we've tried to do is for things like plots, we're trying to make them easy to access as pandas accessors. So just to show that logons.df is a data frame. So a little bit like um, the built-in plot functions in pandas, we have our own uh, pandas accessors. So these appear in MP plot, and there's timeline, there's um, uh, process tree, a few others, we'll see that. And we, we, you can access them. This is another example of being able to access stuff without having to know where to import it from. Um, so I think we saw before the, the timeline in Pete's session last time, so I won't spend any time looking at that in more detail. Um, there's another variant of this, and for this I'm taking the same data frame and I'm doing just a, a group buying count, so we get some kind of statistical information, a count of logons. Um, and this is a timeline value, so it's still a timeline, but it's showing a scale of value. You may say that just looks like a uh, any old plot, but it's um, it's based on the same code as the timeline, um, has the same kind of functionality. Um, you know, the sort of zooming in and all of that stuff. Uh, but this is just showing you timelines of events, but with a with a, a scalar value attached. So you might find that useful. <clears throat> I think Pete also showed you matrix plots last time. Um, um, I want to kind of show you a couple of examples where the the details for it are not actually that. Uh, where I'm deliberately not showing you the details. So so these things over here are actually IP addresses. I'll show them briefly. IP addresses, but we'll zoom back out. Because what is interesting to use, because of Boca's capability of loading very large data sets. Um, oh, why didn't that show you anything? Let me try that again. Did I do something weird? Oh, no. Ha! Don't know why it's not showing the data points. Hmm. OK, that's very odd. Hmm. OK, my entire point about <laughs> showing you this um, is not at all illustrated there. Um, so this was meant to be showing you a, like a normal pattern of logons and then a different pattern during a password spray attack. Um, and even though you can't see individual IP addresses, you could uh, you could at least see how the 
pattern was very, very different. And it, uh, one thing you can see from this, so I, I need to investigate why it's not showing you because it certainly was um, an hour ago. Um, you'd see kind of little circles, but even <clears throat> one of the things, the last point I was going to make, I guess, I guess here was that um, during the the spray attack, there are a whole different set of countries appear that weren't in the original. Um, weren't in the original data set. I'm so, sorry about that. That's normally a very reliable demo um, <clears throat> because it's just so simple. Um, OK, uh, uh, process trees also um, are available as um, a, <clears throat> excuse me, as a um, take just a drink of water because my throat is getting very sandpapery. <clears throat> um, available as a um, pandas accessor, and here we're um, using Microsoft 365 Defender data. I'm hoping this works. This did break last night. I think I had broken it. OK, good. Um, so this works in the same way as you may have seen it demoed from uh, um, Sentinel data, where we can kind of browse through the individual processes, see the command lines. I'm not sure there's anything. This is not specifically very interesting set of data, but you can imagine it's as you, you can do a legend based on account or process type or logon session um, and quickly kind of browse through it, see it colored differently and see the, uh, the um, stuff that you want. Yes, so I'm hurrying a bit, a little bit because I realize I'm a little bit out of time. Um, <clears throat> The last visualization that we didn't see last time uh, is time series analysis. Um, there are some caveats here. It's not very well formatted. Um, so your data needs to be at least a week long. It needs to be aggregated by some time interval like an hour and have a scalar value. So time series is useful for like for trying to look at anomalies that are outside normal trend, like a number of logons in a certain hour um, at nine o'clock on Monday. Um, so, and things like network transmission bytes sent, that, that would be another example of a, a kind of scalar value. So we have something like this, like an hourly count of um, whatever our, our operation was like in this, case it was logons. Um, and then we can do the analysis with a time series anomalies STL and display time series. We're going to create a friendlier wrapper around this. We haven't done that yet, but uh, so you should be able to just launch it from a data frame. Um, and this will show you a graphic of identified outliers. We can see this spike right in the middle that has um, um, particularly large quantity of failed logon that's just happened in this like very short period to and we can investigate that there's another function here called find anomaly periods that actually pulls out the the three periods with anomalies identified so and because these are time spans you can use them in other queries so i just want to you know, have a look at maybe the middle middle one here um got my middle time span. I can put it into a query time thing and perhaps adjust it a little bit. <clears throat> and then go back and use that in a query. So it's just getting all, oh, come on. Near the token type. OK, <laughs> well, if I hadn't messed up my authentication, maybe that's what went wrong. <clears throat> no, 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 it's unrelated. Well, um, let me just. Oh. OK, well, I I'm running out of time, so I won't spend. Time on air trying to fix that. 
but anyway, that's how you would use the time to um, that's how you'd use the time range from uh, time series anomaly patterns to, to feed other queries and other kinds of investigations. Um, I think I'm running a bit short on time, so I'd recommend you look at this, the Mordor browser um, for um, And the Mordor data sets. There's something going on wholesale with my. Oh, no, here it is. OK, good. Um, so it allows you to browse all the different data sets. Um, you can find data sets by specific MITRE techniques, and these are from the um, online uh, OTRF, uh, the Open Threat. Research Foundation, not the Oklahoma Turf Research Foundation, which I looked up first last night. So it's a colleague of mine, uh, Roberto Rodriguez and his brother Jose Rodriguez, um, have built this amazing kind of set of data sets that uh, um, that show you different kinds of attacks and uh, illustrate different um, MITRE techniques. You can download these in the browser. I, I, I actually just broken this, I think, in code. Uh, and there's a command line. There's a command line kind of version of the same thing. Ah, go away, code. Yeah, this was the error I was talking about. Uh, you can also, and this is a query provider, so you can you can just query it like any other provider, and it will download the data set or. Um, for this particular MITRE attack, I think. Right, and there is all the events that are contained in it. Right, let me try and recover from my l whole host of errors that happened later in, in that one. So very sorry about that, just to conclude. So notebooks do give you a kind of flexibility you won't find in any scene, including Sentinel. Um, it's the means to be able to create your own kind of reusable analysis, use different kinds of visualizations, bringing data that's maybe not available in, in the scene uh, and captures the progress kind of as it happens and records it, even if there are errors. And you will always experience errors in notebooks because uh, it's kind of code. Um, but there is a learning curve, so be prepared to invest time in it. And, you know, that the, it, will, it will repay your, the time you do invest in it. Uh, we're trying to reduce that amount of time by building functionality in Mystic Pi, and we're adding more of that kind of stuff all of the time. Um, I would suggest you download this notebook because it has all of these, or maybe take a screenshot. Um, I've tried to include the actual URLs rather than just, um, um, so if you're working from a screenshot. Um, the notebook is in this middle thing. If you go to the Azure, Azure Sentinel Notebooks GitHub repo, in the sample notebooks, there's training Mystic Pi, training three. So this has all of these um, references in there. So there's references back to the original workshops, um, Jupiterthon workshops, which is a conference we had in December, very, very kind of useful. Please visit our GitHub repo, Mystic Pi GitHub repo, and leave us a star. Leave us a star for both of them. Um, references to the docs. I'm going to be talking at the weekend if you're have nothing better to do at uh, 1.30 on Saturday, 1.30 PST at Pi Cascades, at some of the code behind Mystic Pi. Um, it's a great, great looking conference, more Python than InfoSec, but, um, and at the bottom I have some contacts for me, for Pete, for Mystic Pi, um, and a Discord channel that we, we run uh, as part of the OTRF. Okay, and that's about everything. Great, thank you, Ian. It seems like uh, all the questions have been answered in the chat. Okay. Um, so I'd like to thank Ian for being our guest today and for an excellent presentation. And thank you to the rest of the team who helped answer questions. At the same time, I would like to remind the listeners that the best way to ensure you don't miss any future webinars or major announcements is to visit our landing page at aka.ms slash security community. And while there, you'll find easy ways to navigate and find the resources and learning content relevant to our security products and their communities. 
A good start would be browsing our bite-sized product videos, ninja trainings, recordings to past webinars, GitHub communities, and more. We'd love to hear your feedback on how we can improve these webinars. Please take a minute submitting your webinar feedback at aka.ms slash security webinar feedback. Thank you and see you next time. Goodbye.